of Bruno's uh, most influential contributions to capital markets. Good news is that it should be a very relaxing presentation. I'm not presenting anything new, just uh, putting in perspective some well-known results. Bad news is that Bruno contributed, Bruno's contribution is so massive that it doesn't really fit in 30 minutes. So I will try my best, of course, but I may have to uh, take uh, like 10 additional minutes over the coffee break. For that, I apologize in advance, but I want you to know that ultimately it's really Bruno's fault. <laughs> so <laughs> finance uh, uh, has been um, a very um, um, dynamic, fast-growing field for the past 45 years or so, attracted a lot of very bright people, produced uh, mm -hmm. a vast number of cutting-edge results, but if we strip it down to the to the bone and you know, just extract the most significant contributions that hold finance together, the pillars of model finance, well, it's generally admitted, admitted by me anyway, that uh, we have Black Scholes, of course, who established the condition for the absence of arbitrage, the partial differential equation that must be satisfied by all assets uh, to prevent arbitrage. If Jerome Morton, who established the necessary and sufficient condition for any model to respect the initial yield curve. And of course, Bruno, who established the necessary and sufficient condition for any model to respect initial call prices. That condition is on the expected normal, well, normal variance conditional to the spot, which we call the expected local variance or local variance. Um, to simplify, this must be equal to a ratio of sensitivities of uh, current call prices, which are generally written in compact terms uh, with uh, derivatives uh, as subscripts, 2CT over CKK, two calendar spreads over one butterfly. This is something that obviously doesn't depend on any model, but just extracted from the current prices of calls and something that is uh, tradable directly um, through options. We, therefore, we call that the forward variance. It's really the forward conditional variance in normal terms. Um, so Black and Scholes, the groundbreaking paradigm, the, the idea that changed everything is the replication. Options are hedged with trading strategies. Um, a, sorry, it says something super weird here. Uh, Okay, uh, yeah, this, uh, the, the, the slides appear uh, bizarrely on the computer. I think it will be very confusing. Okay, uh, never, never mind. Is it on the meme or is it on the? No, no, it's uh, actually this is all supposed to be on one line. Okay. <laughs> they gave me several you lines. Have, you have two versions with the same name of the file. Was it maybe the other version? No, no, it's the right version, but uh, yeah, you see it kind of displays Bizarrely. Yeah. Shall I bring my computer? Shall I plug my computer instead? No, it's not, <laughs> not a good idea. Okay, okay. So I'm going to use Greek notations rather than sensitivity notations. And since this is a historical presentation, I will try to simplify as much as I can. In particular, I will ignore rates, dividends, repo, and what have you. Um, now, in this case, uh, if, if I... If, if if um, the spot price process is a one factor diffusion, and if we, if we admit that the option price is a function of a current spot price, which was actually demonstrated a few years later in the 1980s, but we go with it just like Black and Scholes did, we can apply ETA to it and find that uh, the after delta hedge, the hedged portfolio is a finite variation process. So it's locally deterministic and in the absence of arbitrage, it must be zero. So we find Black and Schultz's PD and applying uh, by an immediate application of Feynman Katz, we also have risk neutral pricing. Now, Black and Schultz, to some extent, they found a much more powerful result. They discovered a, a kind of universal law of finance. They got much more than what we were, were aiming for because their ori original paper was written in the context of a rather simplistic model where volatility is fully deterministic, in which case the solution is analytic. Uh, it's uh, Black and Schultz's 
celebrated valuation formula, I said of D1 minus K and of D2. This is a very interesting formula. It's very expressive in the sense that it doesn't just give the option price. It actually gives the replication strategy as expressed directly in the formula. But um, however interesting this formula is, it's never been the legacy of Black Scholes is not about the formula, it's not about the model, it's really about the approach. And if I have to summarize it in one word, it would be a replication. Similarly, Bruno's uh, legacy to derivatives risk management is about calibration, the idea that options are hedged with options and models must respect the market prices, of course. Bruno found a necessary and sufficient condition for that in his Unified Theory of Volatility, or UTV, in 96. Uh, uh, and it applies to a wide class of diffusion models. Like many ideas that uh, changed the world, the, uh, the uh, uh, Bruno's formula is very simple and even kind of evident after the fact. In particular, it can be demonstrated in just two lines uh, with an application of Tanaka's formula uh, which is given here, so you can't see it, but uh, uh, hopefully I will post the slides online so that you can see it. This is basically Ito's lemma uh, applied to generalized derivatives. So we applied... <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And this is the demonstration. So if we uh, define forward variance as we, as, we, as we did before, then Bruno's condition is written that the expected local variance must be equal to the forward variance, which is rather intuitive, and there's a square missing in the equation. Uh, in the particular, particularly simple case where volatility is a known function of S, the expectation disappears and we, get Bruno, we revert to Bruno's formula of 1992. Uh, now, like Black and Scholz, Bruno's work is all about the approach, not really about the model and not about the formula. Black and Scholz established the key concept of replication, but they kind of left open the question of the parameters. Now, when we apply our derivatives model in practice and borrowing some modern lingo from uh, the field of machine learning, first we must learn its parameters from market data and then apply the, the model to a more complicated risk management problem, a far out of a money option, an exotic option, or CVA, or something else. And there are two approaches to learning the parameters. One is calibration, implied parameters for the market price of Europeans, and that's a natural approach for every derivatives professional on capital markets. Uh, Bruno's approach is so tightly hardwired in our DNA that it would be a reflex. Nobody would use a model that has not first been calibrated. But if you think about it, for anybody else, it wouldn't be a reflex, it wouldn't be the most natural approach. The most natural approach is statistical estimation with more or less advanced statistical methods. So why is calibration the natural choice for us on capital markets? That's down to something we call the fundamental theorem of derivatives trading. Um, and it's a defining uh, characteristic of Bruno's approach that uh, we always uh, start with a problem, never with a solution. So we don't start with a model, we start with a problem of hedging and risk management. Now, if we assume for everything that follows that we have a diffusion price process, which means that we're ignoring germs, if I buy a call and risk manage it with black soil, some implied volatility, sigma hat, what are my risks? Um, I can find out by applying ITO to Black and Scholz's valuation formula, like this. Uh, be careful, in this, uh, in, in, uh, in this equation, sigma t is the realized volatility. It's not the Black Scholz implied volatility that we use to produce values or, or Greeks. This is the volatility that I experience while, while I'm hedging. Um, so we find, uh, we, we find the price process after delta H, which looks like Black and Scholz's equation, but again, this is the realized volatility. This is not the implied one. However, the uh, Greeks have been obtained in Black Scholz, and so they satisfy Black and Scholz's equation with the Black Scholz implied volatility that I'm using to calculate these Greeks. And plugging this equation into this one, I find that my uh, daily 
PNL, my PNL over a small period, well, and delta hedging. Z equal to, it's not visible here, it's a gamma over, it's, it's, it's half a gamma times uh, the realized variance minus the implied variance times S squared. So in English, the misreplication, uh, the, um, uh, the um, residual term I get in my instantaneous PNL is uh, proportional to the realized minus the implied variance. If I integrate this over the hedge period, I get the fundamental theorem of options trading. Get that my payoff is the premium, the Black-Scholes premium, and the outcome of a self-financing delta hedge. So far, this is the textbook replication formula, but I have an extra term here, which vanishes <coughs> only if, the re if my model predicted, perfectly predicted the realized volatility. Otherwise, I have an error term here, which is uh, the weighted term, weighted by gamma of realized minus predicted normal variance. Now, interestingly, perhaps, you see that this misreplication term is of finite variation, which means that contrarily to a common misconception, derivatives books don't explode when they're uh, managed in a misspecified or miscalibrated model, they bleed. Uh, the only way a derivatives book can explode is if it's not hedged. And there are cases where traders believe that they're hedged, whereas they're really not. But this is a story for another day. Uh, this result was called uh, Robustness of Black Scholes by El Karoui in 98. Fundamental Theorem of Derivatives Trading by my friend Rolf Paulsen in 2015. And we can see from the names alone that this is a very central, very important result in uh, derivatives mathematics. Uh, to the point that it's really hard to identify its original author. The only thing I can say uh, with certainty is this. We first see this result in literature in 98, in El Carvey's paper, but on my first day on the job in March 95, in Bank Paribas in London, Bruno walked me through this result and emphasized how important it was to everything we do. So. Uh, there are many applications of a fundamental theorem. One is the sigma zero formula. And this one, there is no doubt or discussion that it's due to Bruno. It was presented in 1996. So if I, if I copy the fundamental theorem and I apply expectations under Q, be careful here. Q is the risk neutral probability under the real world model, the one that delivers volatility. So the stochastic integral vanishes, of course, and I find that uh, the mispricing, the difference in prices between the correct price in a model that perfectly predicts volatility and my management price under Black Scholes is the expected misreplication. And more generally, if I have model, let's call it M1 and, a model, and another model, let's call it M0, there are two arbitrage-free diffusion models. M1 can be general, M0 has to be a one-factor diffusion then the difference of price between the two models is the expected mishedge from delta hedging with model zero in a world described by model one. So uh, the equation goes like this, and be careful that Q1 and Q0 are not, uh, uh, I'll be with you in just a second, these are not um, um, uh, equivalent, probability, equivalent probabilities in the same model. These are both risk neutral probabilities in two different models, yes? Ah, okay. It's uh, it's uh, it's um, <laughs> it's the it's the it's, it's the risk it's the risk neutral probability in a model that perfectly replicates the volatility that is delivered in the real world. Yeah, but in this case, it's it's just the real world model is just uh, it's 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 it's, um, it's just a view of the mind, if you want. That's model one. That's uh, your reference model, if you want. Sorry if, I, if I've been unclear, but I must continue, but let's discuss, um, let's discuss after. So in the integral and in the expectation, everything is a deterministic function of S, uh, except perhaps uh, sigma. So as before, I can squeeze a conditional, uh, conditional expectation in there. And, uh, and this is the sigma zero formula. Now, uh, there are many, many applications of it. Again, one particular application is the implied volatility formula. We all know Bruno's local volatility formula. This is the reverse, the implied volatility formula. 
Uh, if I consider sigma zero with a management model which is black Scholes with some volatility sigma hat and where my reference model is quite general, uh, applying sigma zero, I find that the difference in price is the expected um, um, mis misreplication term. Now the two models will agree if and only if obviously the difference is zero, which, uh, I, I, which gives me this equation by splitting uh, the integral over the uh, difference operator. And since uh, sigma hat, my management volatility is a constant, I can take it out and find this formula that was uh, uh, presented uh, by Guillaume Blaschet Monday too. Uh, this is a reciprocal formula that expresses the implied variance as an average of expected local variances averaged in spot and time with weights given by the, density probabi the probability density times gamma. Now I will write it here with slightly different notations that emphasize that the implied variance is really a weighted average of the local variances with weights proportional to density and gamma. Uh, density is maximum around the spot today. Gamma is maximum around the strike at maturity. So the sigma zero weights form a kind of suspended bridge between the spot today and the strike at maturity and we average local volatilities over these weights to find um, the implied volatility. Now, this particular formula doesn't really lend itself to a simple or efficient implementation, contrarily to the local volatility formula the other way around, but it's an essential analysis tool for valuation and risk. Leads to many useful results. For instance, you can redemonstrate Bruno's formulas, uh, starting with uh, uh, sigma zero. And uh, Monday, Guillaume uh, gave us, uh, uh, show us an application to calibrate complex hybrid models with impressive speed. Uh, generally, these formulas are taught now in programs in finance that includes NYU, where volatility is taught by Bruno himself, Baruch, where it's taught by uh, Jim Gavrel, whose book, uh, uh, Volatility Surface, discusses in deep detail applications of the Sigma Zero formula and uh, Copenhagen University, where I teach volatility. Um, Yes, I was going to say that later, but no. you saved, no, you saved me a few minutes, but <laughs> that's perfect. So, uh, so among the many, many applications, uh, uh, I would like to, to just show you a back of the envelope calculation to show, to try to, to figure how the spot risk compares to volatility risk. So it's a very rough calculation, it's borderline incorrect, but it's, I, I just want to have an idea of um, the relative sizes of the two risks. So I'm going to do a normal approximation a la Bachelier and a strict first order analysis. Let's look at uh, 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 at the manicole on SMP, the delta is around 0.5, vega is around square root of uh, expiry over two pi. The, the VIX that represents SMP volatility is generally between 10 and 20 outside stress periods with volatility of 15, the maximum loss if I don't delta hedge at all with 97.5% confidence is around two standard deviations. Delta times two standard deviations is 15 square root of T. Uh, if I do delta H, the expected loss from mispredicting volatility by a maximum of five points, like it could be 10 or it could be 20, that's five Vegas, that's two square root of T. Which means that the volatility risk is about 7.5 times lo lower than the spot risk, but it's definitely not negligible. It's actually the same order of idea. And that's why uh, we say that options are hedged with options. If we don't hedge volatility risk, then we will uh, estimate it as accurately as we can with uh, maybe cutting edge uh, stochastic uh, um, uh, uh, estimation methods. But however accurately we estimate our volatility, we still run the risk that it will realize differently. And that's a risk that's quite similar to not hedging at all in the first place. Uh, if we do hedge volatility, however, we must trade options because options are the only instruments that are sensitive to volatility. 
and European options become hedge instruments like and additional underlying assets. Options are hedged with options. Uh, now, if we are going to hedge with options, then our model must respect the crisis. And nobody in their same mind would input a um, spot of 120 in Black Scholes where the spot is 100. In the same way, if we hedge with our options, if these options are our, some uh, additional underlying assets, we must respect their prices. To be, and that's why we calibrate our models. We calibrate volatility rather than estimating it. To be fair, we should also reasonably represent the price dynamics, and that's the main rationale behind stochastic volatility models. So having uh, established the principle of calibration and having resolved it, essentially, Bruno turned his attention to the practical production of volatility risk, what he calls super bucket. So when we use a model because we calibrate it, we have a valuation pipeline in two steps. First, we, we start with a market where we have the market prices of all the calls or equivalently a bidimensional uh, implied volatility surface in strike and expiry. We calibrate the model to this data to find its parameters, for instance, local volatility. And we uh, use the calibrated model in a Monte Carlo simulation or find a difference grid or something else to find the price of say an exotic option, V0. So ultimately, V0 is a function of these uh, uh, market prices, of this bidimensional uh, surface. A super bucket is simply the two-dimensional collection of a differential dV over d sigma hat or dV over dc equivalently. The dV over dcs tell me how many calls of uh, some strike K and maturity uh, capital T, I should sell to hedge my exposure in the corresponding um, implied volatility. Evidently, European options have a single non-zero super bucket since they hedge themselves, but uh, mm -hmm. exotics uh, have a vega that's uh, split, that's exploded over strikes and maturities and hedgeable by trading the corresponding Europeans. Now, this is very easy to write, but uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, famously hard to implement in practice with reasonable accuracy, stability, and speed, uh, which uh, permits me to squeeze a little bit of shameless advertising uh, about my book, uh, which chapter 13 is dedicated to super buckets and delivers some elements of solutions leveraging on algorithmic differentiation and parallel Monte Carlo simulations. So Bruno's legacy to derivatives risk management goes well beyond the local volatility model, which is in itself rather simplistic and criticized, not least by Bruno himself, for unrealistic dynamics. But yet, interestingly perhaps, this model is still implemented as standard in all in-house and external derivative systems I know of 25 years after its publication. Bruno helped establish the universal practice of calibration on financial markets, approaching derivatives from the hedge perspective and systematically applying the fundamental theorem, leading to the idea of hedging options with options, itself leading to the principle of calibration because predict is good, but hedge is better. Uh, Bruno provided a practical, necessary and sufficient condition for any model to calibrate to option and an inverse formula, sigma zero, to analyze option prices across model, models and understand and manage model risks. Um, another uh, another uh, uh, very, uh, very important, very influential contribution of Bruno to capital markets was uh, in the space of variance swaps and the VIX index. Now, the VIX index is a one-month S&P volatility index published by the CBOE. It's highly successful in the sense that it managed to stand as a universal barometer of capital markets nervousness. It was easy for me to find an example in the Financial Times a few months ago. Heightened volatility struck U.S. equities on Tuesday as developments in Italy's political sphere fueled investor anxiety. The VIX index, a widely tracked measure of volatility, was 4.4 points. This is the Financial Times, not the Journal of Mathematical Finance. The VIX is really like became the universal gauge of market volatility. And VIX futures and options mass trade massively on the CBOE. Now, what is the VIX and how is it calculated? I copied and pasted this formula here from the CBOE's white paper. It's rather easy to understand the notations are mainly uh, standard 
Capital T is the maturity, PI is a strikes, R is the interest rate, T is the maturity, one month. Now, this Q of QE here, that's not a probability, that's the actually option prices. So the price of a call if a strike is above a forward or a put if a strike is below the forward. So the VIX square is really the price of a portfolio of European options. It's not any kind of estimation of volatility. It doesn't even have apparently the right dimension. So how is it possible? How does this even make sense? Well, the answer is given in Brunner's founding paper, APSV from 1992, that established the theoretical grounds for variance swaps and for a forward-looking volatility index like VIX. Variance swaps, are, these are exotic options or apparently exotic options that deliver the realized variance at maturity. So the payoff is the cumulated quadratic variation. Bruno asked himself the question, how do we re replicate it and what is the value? In that order, never the other way around. Uh, now, remember the fundamental theorem, which I copied here, I, uh, and expanded the error term around the uh, difference operator. You can see that the term in red looks similar to the payoff of a variant swap, as long as gamma is squared over two is one, or equivalently, gamma is two over a squared. And remember, this is the gamma calculated in black shoes uh, in the uh, fundamental theorem. What it means in English is if I buy some option C and delta hedge it, what I get is this guy, right? Now, if I pick C such that the gamma is always equal to two over a squared, then this thing here is one, and what I get is the payoff of a variance swap minus a constant. Interestingly, perhaps, in general, we don't like this error term, but for variance swaps, we use it to produce the desired payoff. So uh, the, the rest is really high school integration because the gamma, the second derivative, must be two over s squared, so delta, the first derivative, must be minus two over s plus some constant mm -hmm. alpha, so the price must be in minus two log s plus alpha s plus some other constant beta. And that must hold at maturity. So the payoff must be of this form as well. For instance, it can be of this shape here. That's what we call an Acromani delta neutral uh, log contract. Conversely, uh, I leave it as an exercise, as George said, but it's, a, it's a, an extremely easy one. You can find the value of this guy in black shoals, and you find, uh, and you will find this result, which means that effectively this, uh, the value of this log contract is of the right shape. Therefore, the whole thing works. And effectively, to buy the low contract and delta hedge it replicates the payoff of a variance swap. So to replicate a variance swap, I buy a low contract and delta hedge it with black shoes. It follows that the premium of a variance swap is the market price of a low contract. Low contracts are European options. Their payoff only depends on the final spot. But obviously, they don't trade directly. What does trade are European calls and puts of given strikes KI. This being said, like any European payoff, LCs are approximated as piecewise linear payoffs with combinations of calls and puts, as you can see on the chart on the right, or I refer to uh, Karl Madan's formula of 99 for a general presentation. And now we can reveal what VIX really is. Uh, recall that the VIX square is the price of a combination of traded calls and puts of expiry one month. Mm -hmm. This formula simplifies when rates and dividends are zero and the Atwa money option trades into this one, which makes it very clear that it's a combination of call, calls and puts. Well, and what I can do is to chart the price of this combination. Uh, the, sorry, chart the payoff of this combination uh, to find, maybe unsurprisingly, that this is the best replication of a um, log contract with um, the strikes that happen to be trading at the moment. So the VIX squared is really the value of a one month variance swap on S&P, which explains why the VIX is so successful. It's not an estimation. It's a forward looking, tradable consensus extracted from quoted option prices. The VIX squared is what you, the amount of money you need to deliver future realized variance modulo a simple trading strategy. So Bruno laid the foundation of a multi-billion variant swap business for which uh, he is generally credited, but it also follows that Bruno really invented the VIX. And uh, the CBOE's white paper kind of forgets to mention that. Yeah, I, I have to say with the Anthony Neuberger, he did something similar. 
maybe. No, no, no. So it's, well, and, uh, and, and, and really, I'm almost done because the, the next, the last um, massive contribution I wanted to mention is uh, functional little calculus or duper calculus, as you recalls it. Uh, but that was already presented Monday in an excellent presentation uh, by Yuri. So I will just browse through it quickly in journalistic terms. We have seen uh, some fundamental elements of risk analysis and risk management for derivatives, so notion of delta hedge, absence of arbitrage, fundamental theorem, sigma zero formula, and they all rely on first and second derivatives of option prices seen as functions of a current spot, and of course, stochastic calculus and Ito's lemma. But how does it generalize to path-dependent options, to exotic options, which payoff is a functional of a path? Now, thanks to the work of Harrison and Pliska in the 1980s, we still have risk-neutral pricing, but the price is now a functional of a current path. And calculus involving functionals of stochastic processes simply didn't exist. So we didn't have a well-defined delta to hedge, we didn't have a theta gamma equation, we didn't have PNL explained, we didn't have model risk decomposition. Now, the situation was not that bleak because it never stopped market participants to just estimate all these sensitivities by freezing history and apply all these formulas as if they existed, as if they offered any kind of mathematical guarantees. Turns out that we were correct. Tend to think, and it's not the first time it happens, I tend to think of a trading community as a gigantic reinforcement learning machine that uh, tends to learn the correct methodologies um, by trial and error, only sometimes this, yes, but sometimes you see this machine fails, this machine diverges, and we get crazy derivatives. But uh, anyhow, uh, Bruno was faced with a problem where he wanted to extend all these results to exotics, and the mathematics for doing that did not exist. So Bruno did what uh, any decent mathematician will do, he invented the mathematics, and uh, put together, um, uh, the functional Ito calculus, or duper calculus, as we are going to call it from now. Uh, so to define the sensitivities of functional of stochastic processes and demonstrate that Ito's lemma, the theta gamma equation, and all these results we know and love still apply. So Bruno kind of closed the circle, completed financial theory by extending mathematic principles of risk management to exotics, reconciliated theory and practice, established mathematical guarantees for ma market and model risk analysis. And again, I refer to uh, Yuri's excellent presentation, to be honest, the best I've seen on, the, on this subject. Uh, and as a conclusion, you know, Bruno is best known for his local volatility model of 1992 and some People who are not that familiar with Bruno and his work may tend to think of him as a one model researcher. It's really not, this is not correct, this is actually the opposite of a true. Bruno's work always started with a problem, with a problem of hedging and replication, never with a solution, never with a model. All his major contributions, the calibration conditions, systematic application of a fundamental theorem, sigma zero, the variance swaps and VIX, functional calculus, all of this apply to a wide variety of models. So Bruno is really a model-free thinker. And this is further emphasized by his less known work, for instance, mapping major Martingale properties to market arbitrage, personal favorite of mine that he did in 1997. Follow-up work in 2015 on tradable estimates and indicators. Uh, and um, actually, Bruno is, uh, is a very lazy publisher. He published only a tiny fraction of his work. Many contributed through leading research in Société Générale, Paribas, Nico Bloomberg, internal memos like his famous Note de, de Recherche from Société Générale, 200 pages written in French, for real, and uh, of course professional presentations and working papers. And yet, despite this microscopic amount of publications, his contribution is universally recognized and earned multiple prestigious awards which is in itself a testament to his influence and to his legacy. Some of his major research, however, because of a tiny amount of publication, remains less well known. For instance, Bruno delivered the first application of neural networks to finance in 88, 30 years ahead of the current machine learning craze. Did some very substantial work on numerical integration and Monte Carlo simulations around uh, 1995 with his intern, that would be myself. 
and of course a lot of model free arbitrage work outside of the variance swaps or big space. Now, uh, <laughs> now, now I have half, half of. Yeah, no, no, that's, that, 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 of course, that's how, he, that, that's how he thinks, of course, of course. That's how he thinks and that's one of his major legacies, absolutely. So something that you don't see below is that outside of his scientific contribution, Bruno trained and mentored a large number of people who uh, went on to proceed with careers on financial markets. The market even had a name for us. They called us Bruno's babies. And because of Bruno's grooming, some of us grew up to, uh, to really run global derivatives markets. Among others, we have uh, at least three partners and a few managing directors at Goldman. Had a, we had a global head of trading at BNP, that was Guillaume Moblar, global head of research at BNP, that was myself. And um, uh, of course, somebody like Guillaume Blachet, they got a very big job uh, at Bank of America, and many, many others. Now, this is Bruno Dupier, ladies and gentlemen, 60 years of existence as of November 30, 30 years of major innovations, shaping global derivatives market, outstanding thought leader, admirable human being, and incredible friend. Uh, let's do a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Let us thank all the speakers of this session. How much did I spill? It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> no, no, don't answer that now. It's okay. <laughs> Let us thank the speakers. Raphael, you have and a question. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no. Come, come. Stop. Chairman no, no, no. speaks. Chairman yeah, speaks now. Otherwise, I switch off microphones. Are there some questions? One question for each speaker. Yeah, that's why I want to make yeah. this Please, I bring it to you. Raphael, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Martino, uh, so in your talk about the um, Ricat equations, um, the, the Ricat equation is a very, very fantastic subject. It's a very Italian subject, true. Count uh, Jacopo Ricat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you? envisage the generalization for multidimensional case because you are using these integrals that are basically, uh, you know, the risk kernels and you can generalize those kernels directly to multidimensional situations, so can you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you mean uh, the rough Vischer model, for yeah. example, is an application. I guess so, but uh, okay, I'm not really willing to, to follow this direction. Okay. Well. No, not yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, that was my question for Martino. It's 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 uh, it's uh, testimony of how uh, Ito calculus appeared. I, I mean, the, his functional Ito calculus appeared. I mean, one day I remember which year it was, maybe 2010 or something like this. I called Bruno. You know, I say, Bruno, we, we've been you know two of us, you know, very good friends working in finance for many many years. We've never did done anything together, although we, we've spoken so much. What do you think? And then he said, Oh yeah, come over. And that you. And then he was trying to find some intrinsic definition of the theta. And he was like this, you know, and that's also a question I asked myself, what's intrinsic? I mean, this is kind of a natural question. And we spoke of it, he told me all his ideas, you know, how you do, you know, how the project, etc. Uh, the geometry, the intrinsic geometry behind the arbitrage theory. 
And uh, then, uh, well, then it stayed there. And two months later, he sent me a big memo. Look, Freya, I think I, I got something. And that was actually the very first thing of the functionality calculus. That shows you, you know, how uh, those big ideas come. You know, they, they, you come from a simple question like this, and then you, you work it out, it goes in your brain, and at some point, boom, you spit out the stuff. Very, a very nice comment. Uh, I suggest that we leave those comments also for the end of the talk, uh, of the end today. Uh, let me remind you that uh, although it's not in the program, I announced in the beginning, there is a 30 minute um, um, message from Marco Avejaneda, who is not here, but he sent a message to Bruno. So we're going to display that in the end after the talks of the second part of the afternoon. So thank you very much and thanks again. Um, Antoine, for the beautiful presentation for the speakers, and uh, I understand that Joseph has to run now. Yeah. Okay, so we, s we resume in, let's say,